On this fifth Sunday of Lent, we greet each of you warmly in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are so grateful for your presence today, whether you are present with us here or joining us by video stream. And whether you are a guest or a member, if you please help us to know each other better by signing the Ritual of Friendship pad that you find in each of your pews this morning. Though it's hard to believe, Holy Week begins next week with our celebration of Jesus triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Our Palm Sunday service will include the singing of the Hosanna, the flowering of the cross on the lawn, as well as a dedication of a new blessing box that we're going to put on Holly Avenue for our community. We hope that you'll join us next week as we begin our journey toward the cross and the empty tomb. In your bulletin this morning on the green sheet, you will find a strategic plan update we are so excited to share with you what has already happened, and we look forward to sharing even more updates with you in the future. And if you have any concerns or questions, if you'll please make sure to let us know. Please also review the announcement in your bulletin about supporting our Calvary College students. We need your help in filling nine hanging shoe racks with all kinds of goodies that will help sustain our college students as they begin exams and their final weeks of school. And please plan on bringing those small tokens of love anytime between April the 14th and the 21st, and then we will present them to our students on Easter Sunday. Also note that ushers are needed for the Salem Congregation's Easter sunrise service, and if you'd like to volunteer, if you'll please contact Joel Lineback, our head usher. Also, if anyone is interested in helping decorate graves in God's Acre on Great Sabbath, please meet at 9 a.m. in the old section of the graveyard. It is with joy that we announce the birth of John Gladstone Jones V, born to Jennifer Gar and John Jones. John is the grandson of Patricia Gar and the great-grandson of Hubert and Romaine Poindexter. Jesus said, Let the little children come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven.
Let us join now in praying together our liturgy for Lent, which is found on page 72. Shall we stand? Lord God, our Father in heaven, you have shown your great love toward us by sending your Son into the world to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. We give you thanks because you have made us worthy to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, having rescued us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your beloved Son. Son, the Savior of the world, though you were in the form of God, you did not consider equality with God something to cling to, but emptied yourself, taking the form of a servant, being born in human likeness. You humbled yourself and became obedient unto the point of death, even death on a cross. Your love. We give you thanks because you, our merciful and faithful high priest, have made reconciliation for the sins of the people. You were despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. You were wounded for our transgressions. You were bruised for our iniquities. Spirit, one with the Father and the Son, we give you thanks because you descended upon the Christ, anointing him to bring good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the time of the Lord's favor. You heal our hearts.
from the sin of unbelief, from all defilement of the body and spirit, from all self-righteousness, from every neglect of our duty, from ingratitude and selfishness, from lukewarmness, from all indifference to your meritorious life and death. Deliver us, gracious Lord and God. By your holy incarnation and birth, by your early exile, by your pure and blameless childhood, by your willing obedience, by your humility, meekness, and patience, by your faithfulness in your earthly calling, by your fasting and temptation, by your perfect life before God and humanity, blessed. By your tears and agony, your crown of thorns and cross. Lead us to your penance for our sins. By your willing sacrifice of yourself even unto death. May it come unto us the mystery of your love. Into your open arms stretched out upon the cross. Receive us all. sacred wounds and precious blood, by your innocent suffering and dying, by your rest in the grave, by your glorious resurrection and ascension. Bless us and save us, Christ Jesus our Redeemer. Fulfill in us your prayer that all who love you may be one as you are in the Father and the Father in you. Hear us. You have made God known to us as Father, so that the love with which he has loved you may be in us. And in you in us. Christ and him crucified.
As we recall today in our gospel, the gift of Mary when she anointed the feet of Jesus and gave all that she had, may we give all that we have, our hearts and our financial resources to our Lord as we receive our morning offering. We give them for the work of your church on this earth, and we look forward to your kingdom that is coming. And we ask these things through Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Prince of peace. Amen. You may be seated. Our epistle lesson today comes from Philippians chapter 3, verse uh, 4b through 14. If any other man thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. 
Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as refuse, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own based on law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that if possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had, has made me his own. Brethren, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel according to John chapter 12. Verses 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at table with him. Mary took a pound of costly ointment of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of the ointment. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and as he had the money box, he used to take what was put into it. Jesus said, Let her alone. Let her keep it for the day of my burial. The poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the children to join me over by the Calvary Church Bank. is everybody? You can sit down if you want to. How is everybody today? Good. good. You're looking good. Are you getting ready for Easter? Yeah. Be here before we know it. What are these things called? I just took one from the communion table. What are they called? This thing right here. Plate. It's called an offering plate. And what do we do every Sunday with the offering plate? Right, because you can see in here some people have envelopes, some people put a check, there's probably some cash in here. Why do you think we do that? Do what? To celebrate God, I like that. Money for the church, exactly. We can do stuff for the church, we can do stuff for the community. You see, sometimes we forget that it takes money to do all the things that we do. It takes money to keep the lights on, to have air conditioning, to have heat, to be able to pay all the salaries of the people who work here at church, to do mission, to do all kinds of things for God. It takes money to do that. And God asks us, His servants, to give Him 10% of what we have so He can do His work through the church. So we have a very special bank for you and this bank got sort of dirty and messed up when the ceiling fell. And Mr. Ron Bell has worked on it and got it all sparkling clean and working again. And what we'd like for you to do is have a special place where you give your offering every week. So when we finish Moments with the Children and we have our prayer and you go out to Godly Play, I want you to stop by and put your offering 
in the Calvary Church Bank. And something really neat will happen when you put your money in. And I need four people to help me. One, two, three, four. Okay. Pastor Lane's got to get it out of his pocket. There's something really special that happens when you put money in. Here's your quarter. Oh, you want, we can have another one. How about that? All right. Put your money in right there and watch what happens. Oh, the bell rings. Isn't that neat? There you go. And then where do you think that money goes? It goes inside the church and then there's a drawer underneath here and we can take your money out And we count it and we put it in the bank. So that way you'll participate in helping to do God's work at Calvary Moravia. Okay? So let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for all that you have done for us. You have shown us such love and care and forgiveness. And help us to respond by giving you our best, even sharing with your church our financial resources so you can do your great work. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for coming.
let us pray together. Lord, this Lenten season has brought us again the remembrance of your amazing love for us and for all the world. As we have journeyed with Jesus in these last weeks of Lent, we've watched as people have been miraculously healed, challenged, and forgiven. We have seen in Jesus the depth of your love. Lent has also called us to examine our love for you because your word has challenged us to repent of behaviors that are destructive, to be willing to accept a mercy and grace freely given to us who are often prodigal, and in response to show our great love for you. We admit that all too often, Lord, we forget you. We are fervent in prayer when we are in trouble, but negligent in prayer when things are going well. We are more ready to serve when it is convenient, but less prone when other more attractive offerings call for our attention. We are more than willing to give when we have an abundance, but less willing if our giving requires sacrifice. We are more than willing to claim you when we are among fellow believers, but less willing when surrounded by a secular culture. So Lord, help us to show you more love so that loving you will be the greatest desire of our hearts Teach us the devotion of Mary, that we will pour out all we have, investing in our relationship with you, instead of making the wrong investment in things that will only distract and disappoint. And so, Lord of love, we bring before you our deep concerns for others, for our world, and for ourselves. And let us now experience your loving attention as we mention before you in the silence of our hearts those things that trouble us this day. And now, O Lord, may we live the words we sang this morning showing more love to you, the great Lord of our lives. Amen. Our senses can provoke very powerful memory. We can hear a certain melody and suddenly we find ourselves transported to another time and place. We know that our sense of smell is very closely tied to our memory like the way smelling cookies baking in an oven might bring warm memories of childhood. I guess because I was born and raised Moravian, I associate the smell of Love Feast coffee and beeswax candles with Christmas. And I remember that my grandmother always wore the same signature perfume, and to this day, if I smell that perfume, it's almost like being transported back into her very presence. Rudyard Kipling, the great poet, understood this power of fragrance. Smells, he brilliantly observed, are surer than sounds or sights that make our heart strings crack. Interesting. In the story we have before us this morning, it is a strong scent the scent of perfume that stirs up the emotions in the people who have joined Jesus at the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus for a meal. The Gospel writer John tells us that it's six days before the Passover. And just a few days before this, Jesus has come to Bethany at the request of Mary and Martha 
and raise their brother Lazarus from the dead. And now it seems that they're all together, Jesus and some of his followers, simply enjoying a meal together around the table. And Martha, as we know from a previous story, is serving in the kitchen. Lazarus is at table with Jesus, and everyone is reclining at the table as was their custom in that day. When Mary, Martha's sister, the one who was found listening at Jesus' feet, does an extraordinary thing, in fact, an almost extravagant thing. She takes a pound, not a few ounces, of the highly treasured, very expensive perfume known as spikenard, and she pours it upon the feet of Jesus, anointing them, and then wiping his feet with her hair. Spikenard, also called nard in New Testament times, is a class of aromatic amber-colored essential oil that's derived from a flowering plant that grows in, the, in Asia. In the ancient world, we know that spikenard was very expensive, so much so that it was imported, imported in carved alabaster jars. It carried so much value that people would often cherish it almost like it was an investment. It was used in religious ceremonies and in the anointing of kings. We're also told in the Old Testament that it was often used as incense in the first and second temples. John tells us that as Mary anoints the feet of Jesus, the house where they are is filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Mary's valued perfume. This essential oil that she so cherished is now poured out of its protective alabaster jar onto the feet of Jesus Christ. Have you ever done something extravagant because of love? Have you ever spent money that you didn't really have because you wanted to show the depth of your love, maybe for a spouse, a child, or even a friend? Have you ever done something really extraordinary, something other people might have judged as excessive or irresponsible because of love? Mary was in that place. But somehow she really didn't care what everybody else in the room thought. Because her extravagant act of love for Jesus came from a heart that was filled with a depth of gratitude. Put yourself in her place. And remember that it's only been a few days prior to this text that Jesus has raised her brother from the dead. So along with her deep gratitude, maybe Mary's lavish outpouring was also her way of telling Jesus that she was sorry for not having believed in his power to raise her brother from death. According to the story, earlier in the Gospel of John, when Jesus got the message that Mary's brother Lazarus was ill, you'll remember he delayed coming to Bethany for a couple of days. And when he finally does show up, John makes the point of saying that Mary didn't join her sister Martha in going out to meet Jesus on the road. No, she stays in the house. Maybe she was angry at Jesus for not having come sooner. So when Jesus does raise her brother, she not only feels a deep sense of gratitude, but she might have also felt a sense of failure to trust Jesus. So Mary's heart is full of love. And she takes the most precious thing that she possesses, an alabaster jar of expensive spikenard perfume, and she pours it out extravagantly onto the feet of her Lord. 
When I read this text, I wonder if there was a collective gasp in the room when that happened. Or did mouths fall open in absolute astonishment? There's one person in the room that day that was probably offended. In fact, he was. Judas, who would later betray Jesus, the treasurer of the disciples, who was often known to help himself from what was collected, is absolutely incensed by what he sees as wasteful, irresponsible action on the part of Mary. He says, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? You see, if Judas is skimming money off the top of the treasury then he's not so much concerned about the poor as he is about the possible feathering of his own nest because 300 denarii was a lot of money back then. It was the equivalent of a year's wages. So Judas is probably thinking to himself how he could have profited if the spikenard had been sold instead of lavishly wasted on the feet of Jesus. But Jesus is very direct with Judas. Leave her alone. She has brought the perfume that she might use it for the day of my burial. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. You see, Jesus wants those in the room who witness this loving act of worship to understand one thing clearly. There will be all kinds of future opportunities for them to help the poor, but only a short time to love and honor Him as the Messiah. In Matthew's account of this same event, he has Jesus saying these words, In pouring this ointment on my body, she's done it to prepare me for burial. I think Mary was probably taken back when Jesus said this because her sole motive, we think, was to demonstrate love and deep gratitude, her own sense of contrition at having having doubted Jesus' ability to raise her brother. I don't think she had it in mind that she was somehow preparing Jesus for burial. That would have been probably the last thing on her mind because we forget, don't we, that we stand on the other side of history. We know what's going to happen to Jesus. But those who were assembled that afternoon at Lazarus' house, they still aren't sure how all this is going to play out. So Jesus takes Mary's act of worship and He gives it new meaning. Perhaps even trying to help his followers understand that Mary's lavish act of love is somehow symbolic, even ironic, because spikenard was the perfume the Jews used to anoint the bodies of the dead. And the house, John says, was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. The fragrance of love extravagantly given, humbly shared, and it filled the house. That fragrant offering, it becomes real again, brothers and sisters. It is more than a memory from a day gone by when we pour extravagant love out on people we know who may be hurting who are wounded, who are in need of hope. Every time that we minister in the name of Jesus Christ, Jesus' feet are anointed once again and the world experiences the sweet-smelling fragrance of holy love. Judas was self-centered. He was thinking only about what he could gain. But Mary is selfless. She is so grateful for what Jesus has done for her that she wants to give all that she has. So she doesn't just place a drop of nard perfume on Jesus' feet. 
No, she pours out the whole bottle. In February of 1989, the New York Times reported a discovery near the Dead Sea in Israel. It was a flask of ointment found by archaeologists dating to the time of Jesus. It was found wrapped in palm leaves and buried in a pit three feet deep inside a cave. And the flask was full of very rare and valuable ointment. Who owned the flask? The author asked. When and why was it buried? And then he concludes. I know one person who owned a flask of ointment, but she didn't wrap it in palm leaves and hide it deep in a cave. Aren't you glad that Mary broke the flask, poured the perfume, and filled the room with the fragrance of love. Like the widow Jesus told us about who put everything she had into the temple treasury to honor her God, Mary could think of no other gift she could give Jesus except that which was most precious to her, an alabaster jar of precious perfume. That's the funny thing about love. It impels us to do things that we would never have even imagined. And you know what else about this story that I find so meaningful? Mary took a tremendous risk because no respectable woman in that day would have touched a man that she was not married to. Nor would she let her hair down in public. Both of those things were absolutely taboo. They were no-nos in that culture. But Mary loved Jesus so much and she was so determined to express her devotion that the opinion, the criticism, the possible rebuke of other people did not matter to her at all. She had one chance. One chance to show Jesus her devotion and she risked her reputation. We're told that the late Dr. Albert Schweitzer had three doctorates. He had one in medicine, another in philosophy, and yet another in theology. He was also one of the world's most accomplished organists. Dr. Schweitzer was so talented in so many fields that he really could have been anything that he wanted to be. But guess what? He chose to go and minister to the interior of Africa. Why would such a talented man pour out such great amount of his life, all the precious things he had on the poor of Africa when he could have had it all? The Apostle Paul talked about that in the lesson that William read for us this morning. He said, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ as Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as garbage. That's the word that's used in Greek. In order that I might gain Christ and be found in him. You see, for Mary, for the Apostle Paul, for Dr. Schweitzer, for countless others in history, throughout history, there has been only one choice. Giving all they had in service to Jesus Christ. Pouring themselves out. Giving of their best, not for their benefit, but in service to Jesus. And what about us? Will we be stingy in what we give in response? to what Jesus has done for us, or will we be extravagant, giving our best? You know how an advertisement tune can get in your head and it just keeps going and going and you can't get rid of it? I had that experience this week with a phrase in this passage. John says, The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. 
That kept ringing in my ears. Not many of us know the smell of spikenard, do we? But we do know the fragrance of sacrifice. We know sacrifice when we experience it. When we see it. When out of love for Jesus Christ, people do extravagant, extraordinary things. They may give up self. They may give up the very best that they have. Give up all kinds of things to be Jesus to someone else. To anoint someone's feet. Only a week after this event, Jesus will gird himself with a towel in an upper room. And he'll kneel before each of his disciples and he will wash their feet. He will serve them and set an example of sacrificial love. And after washing their feet, he returns to his place at the table, and he turns to them, and he says, Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher, and you call me Lord, and you are right, because I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, then you also should wash one another's feet. You see, when we serve others sacrificially, when we wash each other's feet, this sweet fragrance fills the house. A fragrance of a divine and holy love. When Jesus finished washing the feet of his followers who would eventually betray him, they would run away from him, he said one thing to them. He said, I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And so Jesus calls us. He calls you and he calls me to serve others and to even take the risk of being extravagant that the world might be filled with the fragrance of Jesus Christ Let us pray. Lord, may our lives be a fragrant offering to you. And when others experience our love, may they know your love.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain in your hearts forevermore.